Hello and welcome to Unacademy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. A very good morning and welcome to the Hindu analysis. So let's begin our discussion by first looking at the topics that we are going to discuss. From the international edition of the Hindu, I have chosen seven important articles for a detailed analysis. Today being a Saturday, we have very few articles in the newspaper that are relevant for the exam and I have chosen all the important articles. We have two articles which are more important for the mains examination and few smaller articles that are relevant for the prelims. So before we start with the discussion, we have a big announcement regarding Conquer prelims. As prelims 2024 is fast approaching, we have launched a special crash course to help you cover the most important static topics and as well as the current affairs topics. So the Conquer Prelims Crash Course is being held in two phases. Phase 1 has started yesterday from 19th April where we are discussing the most important static topics from all the relevant subjects. These sessions are being held exclusively on the Unacademy app. The static part of the Crash Course is being conducted on the Unacademy app. The timing would be every day live from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And this phase of the crash course will continue till the 7th of June. So essentially you get 50 live classes and we aim to cover at least 500 plus important static topics through MCQ based discussion so that you can practice as many questions as possible. Then phase two of the crash course will begin very soon right here on our YouTube channel. This is where we will cover the current affairs of the last one, one and a half years. And this crash course will begin from 1st May 2024. The classes will be conducted throughout the month of May till 31st May. So essentially you get 31 live classes and the timing is every day live from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. So do ensure that you attend both phases of the crash course so that Collectively, you can cover 1000 plus topics through MCQ based discussion. Now, I was looking at the comments. I saw that many of you are asking whether the crash course is free or paid. Many of you are also having concerns regarding accessing the classes which are being held on the Unacademy app. So let me resolve this. Just bear with me for a couple of minutes. See, I'll present two easy ways to access these classes which are being held on the Unacademy app. For current affairs part of the crash course, it's never a problem because the classes will take place right here on the YouTube channel where discovery is a little more easier. Even on the app, it's easier to discover, but there could be many students who are new to the app and they don't know how to navigate. So one easy way to access the sessions is first visit the Unacademy website if you're watching through a laptop or a desktop, or if you're watching it on mobile phones, download the Unacademy app. Then select your goal as UPSC CSE GS and search for the faculty names. For example, from yesterday, Sarman Meherad sir has started with polity sessions. So search for the profile of the respective faculty. Once you search, you will be able to see, right, you will be able to see the respective faculty's profile. Now, if you want to know the names of all the faculties who are taking these classes, I have given the screenshot. So, so apart from Sarman sir, Sham sir, Mukesh sir, Abhishek sir, Asta ma'am, Hima ma'am and myself. We will be taking these classes. So you have the faculty names given right here. So search for the faculty name and you will be able to land on their profile. So once you're on their profile page, select the tab related to free classes. So once you click on free classes, you will be getting this particular page where you can see all the listed classes. Under Conquer Prelims, all the listed sessions will be available here. You can click and watch them. The second easy way to access, according to me, this is a much easier option. You just have to join our Telegram channel. Scan the QR code or search for Unacademy IAS English. Join the Telegram channel and every day before the session goes live, we will share the direct link. The class link will be directly provided. You just have to click and start watching the session. You can also visit the community section of our YouTube channel where the entire schedule is given and the session links are also added. So it's very easy to access. You should just figure out for the first time. So do attend the classes without fail. Now, before I start, the other big announcement is regarding the biggest ever price drop at Unacademy. 
as we celebrate the success of our students who have emerged uh, as, as toppers in the recent uh, results. We are offering a massive price drop to help many other students who may find the courses to be unaffordable. So from a regular price of 75,000, the prices have been dropped to 29,999 and 21st April is the last date of the offer, that is uh, tomorrow. So do ensure you take the full benefit of this discount which is being provided and this is available even to the existing students. Let's say you want to prepare for the next attempt. Let's say unfortunately you didn't clear last, last time and you want to prepare again. You can extend your course and you're getting a free extension as well of another three months. So basically at a price of 29.9K, you're going to get 15 plus three months of classes. So it's not just for the new students, even existing students can take the benefit of the offer. Because the full-fledged classes have started in English, Hindi and bilingual and we are also providing optional courses. Most important optional subjects from history to geography and many others are being covered. The classes are starting from April 22nd. So tomorrow being the last date of the offer, I would urge you to call the number given and enroll for the program. So with this, let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu Newspaper by looking at this important article on page number 8. It's a small article actually, but the topic it is dealing with is very, very important. It's very important for international relations, for environment and ecology, and even for geography to an extent. So recently, there was a case at the Supreme Court regarding the forests in India and forest conservation in India. In this particular case, the Supreme Court has passed a very important judgment. And more importantly, it has passed some important uh, observations, which has a lot of relevance as far as environment conservation is concerned. The Supreme Court has pointed out that the forests in India, the forest resources that we have, they are a national asset. The Supreme Court has remarked that the forests that we have in the country, they are a national asset and they significantly contribute to the country's financial wealth. Now you might ask what's so great about this? This is something everyone knows, right? We have always learned from our school days that forest is, is, a, is a part of the nation's wealth, right? It provides a lot of economic benefits. Of course you know this, but what the Supreme Court has pointed out Right? It's something we need to look at and we can even actually go deeper into the topic and understand the contribution of forests to the country. Right? We can understand the socio-economic benefits that arise out of forests, how it helps the nation to mitigate the impact of climate change and we can also talk about certain related laws and legislations and policies that helps us appreciate the role forests play in our economy. So here I would like to take the help of a UN report. I'm drawing from a UN report that was published a few years ago through the UN Forum on Forests. This report was brought out in 2013. This UN report provides great insight into the economic role and social role of forests. The article talks about the economic contributions of forests and how it can help the society, the economy and the communities, especially rural economy, farmers, forest dwelling tribes and indigenous communities, they can benefit immensely through our forest resources. Forests can contribute in nation building, right? They provide a number of economic, ecological, social and cultural services. So you can expect a detailed mains question on this topic maybe even an essay topic regarding forests and their role in, in acting as an asset to the nation's economy. Since ancient times, right, we have been dependent on forest resources. That's what the UN report also highlights. Initially, we relied on, let's say, uh, the hunter-gatherer um, technique to survive as a species. We relied on forest resources for food, nutrition, for shelter as well. Eventually, as humans started civilizing, right, as civilization started coming up, we would rely on land, forest land, for cultivation as we shifted towards a, a agricultural, settled, civilizational uh, species, right? We relied on forest resources to clear the forest land and use part of the land to promote uh, the settlements and to carry out agriculture. So as we progressed as a species, we have started using forest resources for various purposes 
forest provides us with a lot of raw materials, right? The wood, the timber, the, the fuel source, right? And as well as the, the food products, the herbal uh, medicinal properties of certain plants, trees, etc. They all play a critical role in, in human development. So the report talks about the different categories of forest resources which have commercial value and, and socio-economic value. So historically, our forests have been a source of fuel. Right, I'm talking about dried uh, biomass and wood, which has been used as a, as a source of fuel for cooking. Then it has been a source for construction and building materials. Right, even today, construction sector heavily relies on wood. Right, the timber industry, the wood industry is critical. Forest foods, the various fruits, berries, uh, honey and, and various other forest produce, they have nutritional value and even today for tribal communities, indigenous communities, it is an important source of food and nutrition. It plays a role in food security. You can extract many other products, non-timber forest produce, such as fibers, through which traditional handicraft industries can survive. By using fibers, ropes can be produced, baskets can be made and other artifacts can be made, which have a lot of commercial value and it brings revenue to the forest dwelling communities, indigenous tribes, etc. Several trees and plants in the forest, they have medicinal properties. They have herbal value and cosmetic potential. They are used widely in the pharmaceutical cosmetic industry. They are used in traditional uh, systems of medicine like Ayurveda, Yunani, etc. So the herbal value along with the value of timber, right, is what assigns, assigns economic value to our forests. Plus, of course, there are intangible uh, outcomes as well, which you can't measure, which, which you can't quantify like the socio-cultural impact of forests, how it becomes the dwelling space of indigenous communities, how unique cultures and customs come up around the forests, how a symbiotic relationship is formed between the forest dwelling tribes and the forest land. That is something you can't quantify, you can't measure, right? These socio-cultural services, ecological services, because this is the homeland of all the flora and fauna, the biodiversity. Right? So in every possible way, we humans are dependent on the forest and that is exactly what is recognized at the global level as well. The United Nations report talks about the value of forests to human civilization. So understanding this, appreciating this is very critical because even in the modern world, forests are driving our national economy. It contributes significantly to a country's GDP. And now that we are faced with the threat of global warming and climate change, forests have become all the more important. It is part of the mitigation strategy, right? Because forests are a great carbon sink. It's a store of carbon. It can remove the excess greenhouse gases and lock it away for very prolonged periods of time within the food chain, right? And keep carbon away from the atmosphere and play a critical role in tackling global warming and climate change. So forests deliver enormous services to mankind. This is unquestionable. So with regard to forests in India and how we are conserving, protecting our forests, there is a law that you should be aware of, the Forest Conservation Act. In the recent case that came up at the Supreme Court, this aspect was discussed. Apart from the judge highlighting the value of the forest and recognizing it as a national asset, the Supreme Court bench pointed out some of the lacunas that exist in our legal framework when it comes to conservation of forests in India. See, in India, we have had the Forest Conservation Act of 1980, which provides for conservation of notified forest land. But post-independence, recognizing a forest land and notifying it has always been problematic and controversial. In post-independent India, forest has been categorized into reserved forests and protected forests. Right? So, in reserved and protected forests, state governments and center, they play a role in protecting and conserving the forest land. They can restrict human activities, declare protected areas as well, like national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, etc. And thus provide for forest conservation. But however, notifying the forest land 
has been a problem because under the Forest Conservation Act, there have been many parcels of land which actually has a standing forest, but they have not been notified. They have not been included as forest land. And also on the other side, there have been few notified forest land which has been deforested. There is no standing forest which exists anymore, but still it is classified as a forest land. So this was a huge lacuna in our laws, in the implementation of these laws. So there has always been a question mark on what constitutes forest land in India and what is not forest land which can be used for commercial activities. So this has always been a concern. Now this matter was settled by the Supreme Court itself in 1996 in the historic Godwarman judgment. In the Godwarman case in 1996, the Supreme Court broadened the definition of forest land according to the Forest Conservation Act. Because of the confusion about forest land and non-forest land, the Supreme Court said that we should apply the dictionary meaning of forest. The Supreme Court said, forget what the law is saying. The law has a narrow definition. There is a practical problem on the ground that certain notified forest land doesn't even have forests anymore. We have destroyed it. There are standing forests in other places which are not recognized under the law as forest land. So this is a huge discrepancy. So the Supreme Court said, forget what the law says, apply the dictionary meaning of forest. According to the dictionary, if there is a standing forest, right, irrespective of whether it's notified or not, it should be treated as forest land according to Forest Conservation Act. The Supreme Court prohibited the felling of trees in such areas which fall under the dictionary meaning of forest. So this was a pro-environment ruling a landmark legislation, uh, a landmark judgment delivered in the Godwarman case. But recently, this topic has come back in news because the government has been trying to dilute some of these provisions. Last year, the Forest Conservation Act was amended. The Forest Conservation Amendment Bill was tabled in the Parliament, passed by both the houses, and now the amendment has become an act. So let's see what the amendment is trying to do. In fact, when this amendment was brought out, there was a lot of controversy around it, a lot of criticism against uh, the Modi government that the government was trying to dilute the Godavarman case. It was trying to dilute forest conservation and provide for commercial exploitation of forests. So let's examine how does, how does this happen or what's the, the concern here and whether it's a genuine valid concern. See, the amendment is not only trying to streamline the defi definition of forest land, but it is also providing a lot of exemptions. The amendment which has been introduced, it streamlines the definition of forest land, right? It, it provides for inclusion of certain non-forest land where standing forests are present and they can be treated as forest land. They can be brought under Forest Conservation Act. But problem is, the government has given itself the power to exempt several patches of forest land for certain types of projects. So even forest land can be converted for commercial purposes or for certain infrastructure projects. For example, on the grounds of national security for strategic reasons in the border areas near line of control, line of actual control towards, uh, let's say, Myanmar's border or China's border towards Pakistan's border, forest land can be conveniently diverted up to 100 kilometers from the boundary, from the international boundaries. Right? So on one hand, it is understandable why the government needs more flexibility because the government is looking at creating modern uh, border infrastructure to strengthen India's security against uh, the hostile neighbors that we are dealing with. But these wide exemptions being given could be easily misused to divert forest land for non-forest purposes and thus degrade the quality of forests in India. The other concerning provision is that state governments are being given a free hand to regularize encroachments. Now, let's say a local community has cut down forest land and they have set up a habitation. This is an encroachment where people have encroached into forest area in violation of the law. But state governments have been given full flexibility and authority to regularize the encroachment, to make it legal. Right? Let's say an industry has come up or some factories have been built in forest areas by clearing forest land. 
So instead of penalizing them and clearing the encroachment, the amendment allows the state governments to regularize these encroachments. Essentially, it is an indirect way of promoting deforestation and pushing forest land for non-forest commercial purposes. So that is the reason why the Amendment Act has been heavily criticized. There's a lot of controversy surrounding it. Now, let me bring you back to the current case which had come up in front of the Supreme Court. This case was handled by a bench headed by Justice M.M. Sundresh. Justice Sundresh is known for his environment-friendly policies and judgments. Supreme Court Judge M.M. Sundresh is known for pro-environment uh, judgments and pro-environment observations in previous rulings and cases as well. So in this particular case, there was a very unique development in the state of Telangana. What had happened was in Telangana, a patch of forest land had been given to a private individual. And this was done by the High Court. The Andhra Pradesh High Court had passed an erroneous judgment. Forest land had been encroached by a certain private individual. And the High Court ordered the government, the state government and the forest department to transfer this forest land to the encroacher, to the private individual. This was a highly erroneous judgment which was in violation of forest conservation. And apparently, the forest officials of the state government, they also messed up the case. They appealed against the High Court judgment, but they filed the wrong affidavits. It appears as if few forest officials were in collusion with this private individual to grab forest land. So this matter eventually reached the Supreme Court. And this bench, headed by Justice M.M. Sundresh, has struck down the ruling of the Andhra Pradesh High Court. It has said that, such transfer of forest land to private individuals cannot be allowed. It has even called for an investigation against some of the forest officials who appear to be in collusion with this private individual. It has struck down this ruling and it is then that the Supreme Court passed some very important observations. Justice M.M. Sundresh, who was heading the bench, pointed out that forests of India, they are a national asset. We can't simply encroach forest land, give it away to private individuals, commercialize our forest resources. Because forests are critical resources contributing to the financial wealth of the nation. right? And the Supreme Court judge goes on to point out some very important data which you can actually use directly in your answers. Especially if you are writing an um, uh, essay topic, let's say or even a detailed answer in environment or geography or IR related to uh, environmental issues and forest protection. These points can be very, very valuable. Let me take you through these observations. The Supreme Court has pointed out that if we continue on this path of destroying forest land, we are basically leading the entire mankind and other organisms towards extinction. Right? Destruction of forests if it continues in an unabated fashion without any regulation, without any constraints. We are pushing not just mankind, but every other species and organism towards extinction. Then more importantly, the Supreme Court has brought a direct link between climate change, the concept of green economy, which is coming up, and it has tied that with our forest as a resource. Now, for example, let's say if a country has a certain type of mineral, or if a country has oil, right, as a, as a resource. We treat that as a valuable commodity, a precious commodity, because there is a value attached to it, a commercial value. Similarly, forests have a commercial value today. I'm not just talking about the forest products and raw materials. I'm talking about green economy concepts, such as carbon credit and green accounting. Today, in budgeting and accounting, green accounting has become the norm. Carbon credit as a concept has been introduced based on the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which was the first climate change agreement under the Climate Change Convention. Right? So you can trade these carbon credits in carbon markets, just like you trade with equities in, in stock markets. So the Supreme Court judge has observed that if we protect our forests, which is a carbon sink, right? it basically can generate carbon credits for us. We can build an entire monetary uh, market around it. And we can maybe sell those carbon credits to other countries which have a deficit. Other countries which continue uh, their emissions, which are not contributing uh, enough to, to climate change efforts. 
they can purchase carbon credits from countries like India if we can protect our forests and if we can create a, a market model where we can bring in green economy concepts, use carbon credits, right? increase afforestation, increase the carbon sink in the country and sell the carbon credits to other countries which have a deficit. So this could bring enormous wealth to the nation. It could add to the country's revenue, to the country's GDP. So excess forest cover is a boon, it's a resource, not just for the commodities and the produce, but for carbon credits which can be monetized. So that is why the Supreme Court has said that forests are part of the country's financial wealth. The Supreme Court judge refers to a very important report of the Ministry of Environment and Forests, which talks about the carbon sequestration potential of forests. Carbon sequestration is the process through which excess carbon and greenhouse gases are removed from the atmosphere and locked away either in forests or uh, through other artificial methods as well, right? And forests are a natural carbon sink. It's one of the best known carbon sinks. So if you put a value to this, if you assign a commercial value to this, according to uh, the government report, at a conservative estimate for absorption of one ton of CO2, you can place a commercial value of at least $5. And forests in India have enormous potential to remove thousands of tons of CO2 every single year. This could translate to economic benefits worth $120 billion and above. The report of the Environment Ministry states that India's carbon stock has increased over the last few decades. If you compare India's forest cover from let's say 1995 to 2015, you see a major increase in forest cover. Not just until 2005, but until 2015. You look at the State of India Forest Report, brought out by Forest Survey of India. The green cover in India has expanded. If we treat that as an asset and capitalize on the asset, it can play a big role in carbon sequestration, generate more carbon credits, and we can monetize that. The judge also has pointed out to a report by the RBI. RBI brought out a report on India's macroeconomy and how our macroeconomy could be impacted because of climate change. The report was published last year, the 22-23 report on India's macroeconomy and what is the impact of climate change on India's macroeconomy. So according to RBI's assessment, by the middle of the century, by 2050, climate change will drag our GDP by 2.8% because of increased disasters because of increasing frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, rising sea levels. There will be a huge socio-economic cost, especially on the weaker sections, on forest-dwelling tribes, coastal communities, the poor and the weaker classes. They will face a disproportionate impact of climate change in the coming years. This will translate to an economic loss of 2.8% of our GDP by the middle of the century. By the end of the century, this could increase to 3% to 10%. That is what the RBI has predicted. This will be the severe economic loss that the country is going to suffer in the coming years. So forest as an asset, as a resource, if we conserve and protect the resource, it can actually add value and help mitigate the adverse consequences of climate change. So these are some of the important observations made by the Supreme Court in this particular case. And that's why I told you, even though uh, the development itself is not so important, right? The observations, the findings that came out in this case gives us a lot of points which we can use for answers in various subjects. From geography to IR to environment, even to essay paper. If there are related questions on forest and forest conservation, you can bring all these points and build a very beautiful answer. So with this, I complete the discussion of the first article. Now let's look at the second article. On page number 12, we have a column that talks about the debt crisis in Africa. Many top economists and as well as strategic experts and analysts, they're all predicting a looming debt crisis across African countries. Not just one or two countries, but multiple African nations, right, which are already poor and backward. 
they are facing a massive external debt or foreign debt crisis they are reaching a stage or they have already reached a stage where they are no longer able to service foreign debt meaning they are no longer able to sustain the debt repayment so this could lead to the crash of multiple african economies and this can have very serious consequences not just economic and social consequences but very serious geopolitical consequences so let's go beyond the article again that's what we always do with these important articles right let's look at uh, the topic in more detail and let's understand what's happening in african economies again if you ask me how is it relevant for the exam you will understand just stay with me for 10 to 15 minutes i'll explain how this is directly connected to india's foreign policy and india's interest in africa the article is referring to a particular case in a west african country called ghana ghana's economy has crashed over the years right it's a very poor country it has great resources but governance is very poor corruption there has been a history of violence as well in the country right enough development opportunities um, have not been created it doesn't have the right infrastructure right so ghana is suffering as a economy and its debt burden has shot up beyond its capacity it's facing a standing foreign debt of 30 billion dollars and it is in no position to repay the debt the situation is only going to get worse and right now the government of ghana is looking to restructure the debt so that it can avoid a potential default and somehow survive the crisis now this is not just the case with ghana there are many other african countries facing a similar scenario at least 16 plus african countries 16 plus countries are facing this crisis is that clear they are not able to pay the outstanding debt large part of their borrowings are from foreign entities they borrowed heavily from global institutions like uh, world bank asian development bank african development bank etc they've borrowed from other countries as well from china from other foreign donors even india to an extent has provided some loans right so they owe a lot of foreign debt they're not able to pay the uh, interest the repayments and they're struggling so that is why many countries have approached a informal group called the paris club now this in itself is an important topic what is the paris club of creditors you should know the basic history and the facts about paris club because it is very relevant to india as well recently our neighbor sri lanka also faced a similar economic crisis and a debt default right sri lanka defaulted on its payments its economy crashed its forex reserves had been depleted so sri lanka also has been working out a deal with its creditors it's trying to restructure the debt and it's getting a bailout package from imf from international monetary fund so sri lanka has been in talks with this informal group called paris club of creditors so according to available data more than 16 african countries they owe payments worth 22 billion dollars in just 2023 so the debt burden is very significant they are basically in a debt trap now let, let me give you some basic facts about the paris club itself which is uh, important for your prelims as well then i'll come back uh, to the african debt crisis let's deviate for a second let's talk about the paris club it will only take a couple of minutes some important facts are needed for your prelims and after that we'll come back we'll come back to the discussion on african debt problem the paris club of creditors is an informal group of few crediting or creditor countries especially the western developed industrialized economies which provide loans which provide uh, debt to other countries to developing nations they have formed an informal group called the paris club its history can be traced to 1956 when argentina which had borrowed from the western countries could not repay the loans and it approached the creditor nations asking for relief asking for a solution so some of the countries which had given the loan they got together and they restructured the loan itself they restructured the payment uh, schedule brought down the interest rate as well and as a result argentina managed to survive the debt crisis so since then the paris club became a informal grouping around 22 creditor countries came together to form this informal club 
and what they do is they work out a restructuring plan to a country which has been facing a debt problem right if a country has borrowed heavily from these uh, creditor nations and international institutions and if it is not able to repay right so instead of going towards a default and and crashing the economy bankrupting the economy countries can approach the paris club the debtor countries which have taken the loans they can approach the creditors call for a solution through the paris club and paris club countries which are the creditor nations will work out a solution a restructuring solution so this will give a temporary relief and then the country can seek some help from imf asking for a bailout package from the imf to bail out the economy so there are 22 permanent members in paris club so please note down which are the permanent members you, if you observe most of them are western developed industrialized economies you have australia denmark germany even us and uk right so all these countries these are the 22 permanent members of the paris club there are ad hoc members as well who participate whenever necessary which includes india i think there are 13 ad hoc members if i'm not wrong so india china and few others they are ad hoc members who participate when it is necessary now for example if you look at sri lanka's recent debt problem sri lanka could no longer service the debt it was facing uh, bankruptcy potentially so it approached the paris club and the imf for a solution so along with paris club of creditors which includes these 22 members even india participated in the restructuring talks see japan is already one of the permanent members of the paris club so sri lanka had borrowed heavily from japan from india and also from china and from international markets so sri lanka which was looking for a solution for a restructuring plan it approached the paris club of creditors india being a big donor to sri lanka also joined as a ad hoc member along with japan which is the other major donor to sri lanka so together they worked out a restructuring plan the paris club of creditors along with japan and india as an ad hoc member they found a solution to restructure sri lanka's debt but china did not join these talks china said we will not be part of the paris club negotiations instead we will work out a bilateral solution China said we will bilaterally talk to Sri Lanka and restructure the debt on our own, but we will not participate through Paris Club. That also shows the geopolitical dimensions of a debt trap. There are accusations that China misuses the debt burden of other countries and further pushes them into a debt trap. It's often called debt trap diplomacy of China. It uses the economic sufferings of other countries, smaller countries, to gain strategic advantages. We have seen this happening with many countries in Africa, in Asia, with Sri Lanka itself. China seeks strategic advantages and opportunities in return for assistance. China gives out these loans even when it knows very well that projects might fail, the small countries may not be able to repay the loans and further pushes them into a debt trap. The debt burden becomes a debt trap. And it always strikes bilateral deals. It does not work through such multilateral groupings. Right? Because China is least bothered about the well-being of the other country. For example, India is genuinely concerned about Sri Lanka's economy. We genuinely want to help. We have given $4 billion worth of assistance to Sri Lanka. Right? So we were more than willing to be a part of Paris Club negotiations and we promised all the support and delivered on the support to Sri Lanka. Japan as well did the same. But China deliberately stayed out so that it could use the debt trap to an advantage and maybe seek strategic opportunities in return. So this is something you should be aware of. Now coming back to Africa's debt problem. This is very, very serious in fact. Especially the COVID-19 pandemic and the major wars that have broken out. Russia-Ukraine war, the Gaza war, the tensions in West Asia. This has destabilized the global economy and this has further affected African economies. Because poor countries are always at the risk of getting affected more. So in the last four years, African economies have seen a downturn. All right. 
So the debt has ballooned in many African countries. It is just a graphical representation which shows the increasing debt burden. Just look at the kind of money that African countries owe to private creditors and official government creditors. The debt burden has been increasing almost exponentially over the years. Now, the other problem in Africa is that many countries are witnessing political instability, massive inflation and multiple economic challenges. I'm sure all of you have heard about the basket case in uh, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has witnessed runaway inflation. Even if you take a carload of money and cash, you can't even buy a loaf of bread in Zimbabwe. That is the state of inflation in Zimbabwe. So many countries across sub-Saharan Africa, it's one of the poorest regions in the world, right? Even though these countries are blessed with resources due to outside exploitation, due to their own internal problems, domestic problems, they have not been able to exploit the resources and develop. So today, many countries here are facing a massive economic problem, right? Inflation is massive. Their debt to GDP ratio has shot up to alarming levels. So you can see this in some West African countries like Ghana, Sao Tome, Angola, Liberia. You can see this in other important countries as well like Nigeria, Egypt, even Sudan. Many Central and even Southern and Eastern and Northern African countries. Many of them are facing a similar problem. Just look at the debt to GDP ratio and how many of them are facing political challenges as well. You'll be alarmed at the numbers. Many countries have witnessed military coups. Africa is not new to such military coups, but recently it has become a trend. It has become a very common trend across African nations, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, in this belt. Stretching from Atlantic to the Red Sea, multiple countries have descended into a civil war. They have seen a rise in extremism, terrorism. Military regimes have taken over. They've toppled governments, right? Or one dictator has toppled another dictator and there has been a new regime. Essentially, political instability has gone up across African nations. So all the worst case scenarios are taking place in Africa, which further threatens these African economies. Look at the debt to GDP ratio. How many countries have more than 100% debt to GDP ratio? How many countries have a debt to GDP ratio of 70 to 100%? These are alarming numbers. You need not by heart all the numbers, but understanding the trend, understanding the overall analysis is sufficient. Now coming to my last point. Now, how does this impact India? How does this affect Africa as well? See, India has always been very close to African countries. Since independence, we have supported the decolonization movement of African nations, uh, especially Prime Minister Nehru was a big believer in decolonization and gave complete support for decolonization of Africa, right? We have close historical cultural links with most African countries. We have a strong Indian diaspora population as well in many African nations, right? Indian traders, merchants, Indian uh, indentured laborers, who are all uh, transported to Africa. Many of them remain in Africa and they form a cultural connect with India. And moreover, Africa is the land of resources where Western countries have always tried to dominate and exploit the resources for themselves. Be it US, be it European powers, they've all exploited African nations, right? In many ways, they're responsible for the political and economic problems. Even Soviet Union and later Russia has been involved in destabilizing regimes to protect their own interests, to protect their own economic interests. They have destabilized entire African nations. So they take the blame for what is happening in Africa. And now there is a new entrant, that is China. China has significantly expanded its influence across Africa through its Belt and Road Initiative, through the cheap loans, the so-called cheap concessional loans it provides. It has made a mark for itself and it has invested heavily across African countries. It has increased its diplomatic presence, its military presence. It has given plenty of loans to many African countries. Problem is the loans always benefit only the dictators in the military regimes. 
right? All these are corrupt regimes. They corner the money and the debt burden of the economy will increase. The common people will suffer. So China, in a way, is responsible for at least part of the debt burden in Africa, if not for the entire part of it. Now, this is where India can play a balancing role. India can harness African resources, build genuinely good relations with Africa, which will mutually benefit both the sides. For example, the former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh initiated India-Africa Forum Summit. In 2009, India-Africa Forum Summit was held by then Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. Three such summits were held that brought India closer to the African countries, to the African Union, which is the regional group, right? India started working closely with African Union and other regional economic blocks that exist. For example, you have Southern African Development Council, you have ECOWAS, which is the economic community of West African states. There is COMESA, the community of uh, Eastern and Southern African countries. So India works closely with all these regional blocks from African Union to SADC, ECOWAS and COMESA. We are closely involved with many of these African countries. We are providing them development assistance. India has invested money to create infrastructure to help them in healthcare, in education. Through Pan-African E-Network project, which was a brainchild project of uh, President Abdul Kalam, India has extended telemedicine, tele-education uh, through our satellite services. Right? So India has been playing a big role as a development partner and we have championed the cause of the global south. You might remember, recently India organized the Voice of the Global South Summit in the run-up to the G20. And during India's presidency at G20, we secured a membership for African Union. It was India's initiative, initiative of the Modi government, which secured a seat for African Union as the 21st member of the G20. Right? So under the G20, there is a common economic framework which has been established under India's leadership, which can potentially help in solving this problem, the debt problem. The G20 Common Economic Framework, along with African Union's membership to G20, which has been possible due to India's effort, India's initiative, Right? Through G20, we can give better assistance to these African countries. The Paris Club can work together and restructure the loans and potentially save these countries from facing a debt crisis. Now, this could substantially increase our influence and help us counter Chinese influence as well. It could secure important raw materials and resources which are much needed for India. From agricultural land to export markets, Right? Africa is a huge market for Indian exports, from drugs to automobiles, right? even telecom, IT and software. We have plenty of exports headed towards Africa. Plus, we can get hold of critical resources, from lithium to cobalt, right? all critical strategic minerals that we need. We can access them by promoting our influence. So that is why the debt crisis in Africa is a matter of concern, but it's an opportunity as well for India. So this completes my discussion on the debt crisis in Africa. Now let's head towards the prelim section and take a quick look at the smaller articles. On page number three, we have an article related to India's relations with Philippines. We were discussing the topic yesterday as well, the South China Sea dispute. And today again, we have a related article. India has started the delivery of the BrahMos cruise missile to Philippines. So it's an update, nothing much to discuss here. It's a very important update. I told you yesterday that India has developed a more nuanced approach towards the South China Sea dispute. From the previous neutral position, we have become more proactive under the Act East policy under the Indo-Pacific Doctrine. And we have extended direct support to Philippines. Recently, India's Foreign Minister Dr. Jai Shankar stated that India fully supports the rights of Philippines with regard to its uh, territorial uh, dispute with China. Right? And a few years ago, couple of years ago, Philippines approached India for procuring the BrahMos cruise missile, signed a deal, a multi-million dollar deal, and now India has started the delivery. Through our transport aircraft, Indian Air Force has delivered the first batch of BrahMos cruise missile. Now, this is a very big development because BrahMos, it's a joint project between India and Russia. It's a joint venture. 
and it's one of the world's fastest cruise missiles and very accurate cruise missiles. As of now, no existing air defense systems can intercept the BrahMos. So selling such a critical platform, which is so versatile, presents a great opportunity for Philippines to deter the Chinese threat. Because as I mentioned yesterday, China has been openly threatening Philippines. It has violated Philippines sovereignty multiple times. Chinese Navy and Coast Guard, they threaten uh, Philippines rights. China has disobeyed the orders of permanent court of arbitration, right? So China has done everything possible to be as aggressive as possible against Philippines. Now, BrahMos being such a versatile, flexible missile, it can be launched from land, air, and as well as from, um, from sea and even from uh, submarines. It's one of the most versatile missiles in the world, which can be launched from all mediums and different platforms. Now, the variant that Philippines has procured is specifically the sea variant, which can be used to target ships and coastal uh, shore-based uh, targets. So, the sale of BrahMos is specific to target China. In a way, India has armed Philippines to protect itself and deter the Chinese threat. You can compare this with how China arms Pakistan, right? And uses Pakistan to target India, deter India. So, in a similar way, now India has become very proactive in this regard, playing a bigger role in South China Sea. And now we have started delivering the BrahMos missile to Philippines. This could encourage other countries as well. Maybe Vietnam. Vietnam has been uh, requesting for BrahMos from a long time. Or maybe Indonesia. Even Indonesia has shown interest. Right? Even they have uh, disputes with China. So they could all become potential uh, buyers, which would increase India's defense exports and make India a strategic uh, player in the Indo-Pacific. Next article on the same page, it's related to a unique fossil which has been found in Kutch region of Gujarat. A team of researchers from IIT Roorkee, they stumbled upon one of the oldest fossils of a snake, one of the largest snakes to have lived on earth. It's a very interesting find and I feel it can come as a prelims question, right? A team of researchers who are excavating in the Kutch region of Gujarat which at one point in time, right, was a, a coastal area, probably as, as part of the Gondwana land, right, where the continent split and, and later moved to the current positions. The Kutch region in particular was, was directly exposed uh, to the coastal uh, environment and ecosystems, and it had a very uh, different uh, environment and, and uh, different conditions, right? I'm talking millions of years ago with regard to the geological uh, time scale. So this fossil which has been discovered here, it's been dated at least 47 million years. It belongs most likely to the middle Eocene period under the geological time scale. And the vertebrates have been found. They have been preserved in very good condition. You can see the image as well, right? These are the fossils that were discovered. And the, using this, it has been reconstructed. A digital reconstruction has been done regarding the, the size and, and the type of the snake it could have been. It's a very long snake, according to researchers, that existed millions of years ago, 10 to 15 meters in length. That is the estimate. So this species has been named as Vasuki indicus. Please remember the name. So it belongs to an extinct family of snakes called the Matsoidae. It's an extinct family of snakes. It doesn't exist anymore, right? But millions of years ago, these were some of the largest snakes in the world, stretching up to 10, 15 meters in length. And Vasuki indicus, the fossil which has been discovered, belongs to this family. Now, why is this important? Let me tell you. See, these findings help us understand ancient ecosystems that existed. It helps us understand the origin, the evolution of snakes. Because today, the snakes you find, is it, it, they are very different from, from the ancient snakes that have been, the fossils that have been discovered, right? One theory that researchers have proposed is that these snakes were probably very, very long because it was an adaptation to the climate. They point out that, right, during this period, the middle Eocene period, during this period, Indian subcontinent was co-joined with Africa and South America. The Gondwana land had just split and still South America, Africa and India were co-joined or conjoined. So the tropical environment that might have existed then, the temperatures would have been drastically different. Studies have shown that temperatures might have been unbearable 
and that is why probably these snakes underwent uh, evolution. They underwent an adaptation. They evolved to adapt to the extreme heat by developing longer cylindrical bodies so that it could easily dissipate the heat. So you can learn a great deal of things about the geology of the earth, the evolution of our ecosystems and these species as well. That is why it's an important finding and there could be a possible question. So remember the name Vasuki Indicus. Next we have an article referring to the National Commission on Scheduled Tribes. The National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. The article itself is not important. It's talking about a tribal identity in India, right? It's a very political article. But the point that is important for us is this constitutional body. You can definitely expect a polity question here on the National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. So point number one, please remember it's a constitutional body established under the provisions of Article 338A of the Indian Constitution. So let's see what is its history. What is its composition? What is its role? That's what you need to understand. See, initially, there was no national commission for scheduled tribes or scheduled castes. The constitution had provided for just a special officer, special officer for SEs and STs, and the president of India had the power to notify the scheduled tribes in the country. But later, through the 65th Amendment Act, Constitutional Amendment Act, Article 338 was amended to establish a joint commission, a national commission for both SCs and STs to look after their welfare and well-being, to study and identify the factors affecting the SCs and STs and submit reports based on which uh, better welfare can be carried out for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Then through the 89th Constitutional Amendment Act in 2003, these commissions were split a new article was also inserted, Article 338A. So the previous article, that is 338, it provided for National Commission for SCs and the new article inserted, 338A, would provide for the establishment of a separate National Commission for SDs. So this is how two separate constitutional bodies were created to look after the welfare of SCs and SDs in India. So talking about the NCST, it comprises of a chairperson, a vice chairperson and three members. Of course, appointed by the government, that is in the name of the president. And the terms of service is also determined by the president, essentially the government itself. Now, the primary function of NCST is to look after the ST community in the country, to look at cases of atrocities against them, to investigate their status, their socio-economic educational status, recommend government policies, how, uh, understand how reservations are working, whether it's really benefiting the ST community, look at issues affecting them, right? The healthcare problems specific to certain tribes, come out with recommendations on how these problems can be tackled and submit those reports to the president. And the president can lay these reports uh, in the parliament as well. So that is the function of National Commission for Scheduled Tribes. Is that clear? So it plays a very important role in the welfare of uh, the tribal community in India. I have given the term and the eligibility for reappointment of the chairperson, vice chairperson and the members as well. So please go through this. Remember the facts. You can get a direct question here. Coming to Article 6. This article is referring to a very important South Pacific Island country called the Solomon Islands. Elections were held recently in Solomon Islands, which is a very important nation in South Pacific. And the incumbent Prime Minister is likely to win and form the government again. Now, this is a matter for concern. It's a matter of concern for US, Australia and India as well. Because the leader you are seeing here in the image who has won the election, the current Prime Minister, he has been known for his pro-China policies. Recently, he signed a security agreement with China. China and Solomon Islands signed a security cooperation deal which allows Chinese Navy to deploy its naval assets in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. Right, so China's military diplomatic influence has grown thanks to uh, this leader in Solomon Islands and this is a threat for the major powers here that is Australia, uh, US and even to India because India has focused on South Pacific in the last few years. 
Now, please look at the map. I'll show you where Solomon Islands is located. Right? This is where Solomon Islands are located, to the northeast of Australia. So, in the South Pacific, there are many Pacific Island nations like Palau, Nauru, Vanuatu, Fiji is very important in particular, Tonga, French Polynesia, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, etc. Right? All these countries are part of the Pacific Islands Forum. They have a grouping as well called Pacific Islands Forum. And India works very closely with this group. We have created a separate platform, India Pacific Islands Initiative, India Pacific Island Countries Initiative. Right? Uh, the Modi government in particular has paid more attention to the region as the Pacific region has become uh, more critical with regard to China's uh, expanding influence. So traditionally here, Australia and New Zealand were the dominant powers. The US is also very influential because it has a territory here that is Guam, which is an American naval base. Japan also is quite influential here as it's part of the Pacific. So India is also actually influential because in countries like Fiji, there is a very strong Indian community. These are all British colonies, some of them. So Indian laborers were transported here through the indentured labor system by the British. And a large percentage of the population of Fiji, they are of Indian origin. So we have a lot of cultural uh, influence and a direct connect here. We are stepping up our influence as well. Recently, India has donated a lot of funds. Uh, PM Modi has met with all the leaders. Right? We have created a separate forum where, where India and Pacific Islands can interact. So the concern here is China's security agreements with countries like Solomon Islands. So that is why the topic is relevant. Now coming to the last article for today. The article is referring to Hainan Free Trade Port of China. This is a modern port city that China is developing in South China Sea. Just like, uh, let's say, Dubai, right? How UAE has, has set up Dubai as, as a massive commercial hub with advanced infrastructure, port, and logistic facilities, right? It has turned Dubai into, into a tourist destination, into an investment destination, a tech hub, a manufacturing hub. Similarly, China has plans to create an ultra-modern city called Hainan, the Hainan Free Trade Port Area. It is coming up over here of the coast of China in South China Sea. China has said it's about to complete the construction, right? It wants to turn this into a major investment destination and project Chinese economic influence all across the region, right? So it will have a modern port facility with advanced logistics, uh, airports and residential facilities, industrial parks. So it's a massive investment destination that China is creating. And what is unique is that it would be one of the most open systems as far as China is concerned. Because as you know, China is a communist authoritarian state, right? But if you're an authoritarian country, investors will not come in, right? Foreign entities will not, uh, will not come into such uh, territories. If you look at, let's say, West Asia, even they are authoritarian monarchies and uh, dictatorial regimes. But they have been able to attract foreign investments because they have created a more free and open culture and open societies at least for foreigners at least. That's what China is planning to do. China has said it will have very relaxed uh, regulations and provisions, mainly to attract the investors and create uh, a, a futuristic modern hub for various manufacturing services and industries, right, and drive the growth of the region. So this is something you should just know because there could be a map-based question in your prelims. So on this note, I would like to complete the discussion for today. Please look at the mains practice questions. Use them to write answers and post the answers in the comment section below. So with this, I would like to bring the discussion to an end. I hope you guys have liked the session, understood everything. And if you have any concerns regarding conquer prelims, please let me know in the comments. And if you're li liking the crash course that we have started, let that uh, please let us know as well, because that will allow us to plan better and deliver better for you. So that is it for today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Have a good day.